When Steel Talks, everybody listens. When Steel Talks is very pleased to have the opportunity to sit down and speak with Andy Akiho, a composer, pianist, uh, performer. You know, you just run a wide gamut of music. But I mean, we've been around you and we know of you and the Steel Pan world globally knows about you for a number of years. But I think this is the first time we're actually having the chance to sit down and speak with you. So. Welcome to Word Steel Talks and thank you for taking time out of your jam-packed schedule because catching up to you is really a challenge. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, I'm very good to have you. I'm really so, excited. <laughs> yeah. Time to sit it's down, right? Good to see you guys. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, tell us a bit about Andy Akiho, the person, how you got involved with the steel pan instrument, when were you first introduced, just to give an idea of you know how it all came together. Yeah, I, f I first got involved in um, 1997. Oh, you got a time yeah. frame as well. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I remember. I don't really remember my life in um, years, in the date. Like, I don't even know how old I was in, but I know the date. 1997 um, was the beginning. Because I, I, was, I started college then, undergrad at University of South Carolina. Right, and uh, you came up with your bachelor's in music there. Yeah, that's um, when I was doing percussion. Mm -hmm. and, um, I just got I, got I got involved in everything that the department, percussion department, and the school music had to offer. Mm -hmm. So I just did everything. So it was like symphonic band, uh, drum line, you know, um, West African drumming. You got inside, you know, yeah. you got in tune with your percussive, your rhythm yeah, side. I, I, I was just I was just super happy to do music for my life. And, wow! And just yeah. everything that. Mm -hmm. Everything that was available, I was super hyped about, and and steel band was one of those things as well. I didn't At the University I'm of North Carolina, University of South, South Carolina, Carolina. Yeah, uh, Gamecocks, and uh, so that was your first introduction to Pan. Yeah, that's the first time I saw one mm -hmm. that I know of. I probably had heard it and didn't know what it was. Yeah, but your interaction—that's where your journey with Pan began. Yes, and it was it was really light at the beginning because. I didn't really take it serious. Mm -hmm. I was just in the band mm -hmm. with the other things. And then, yeah, later on, I mean, I don't know how far you want me to go in the car. No, but why is Steel Pan, uh, you know, essentially your instrument of choice? I mean, from so, coming yeah, from 1997 there, right. to now. So then, you know, then I, I, I really enjoyed playing in the band. And I, I didn't know much melodic percussion yet. I was more like a drummer back then. And um, playing the steel pan for me and learning marimba, learning all the melodic instruments uh, was a new thing for me, like dealing with notes. And, yeah. And, uh, I, you know, I didn't take it too seriously, but I had fun playing in the band. It was, you know, it was like typical calypso tunes, but even not even the really cool, like Trinidadian stuff yet. Like it was more like, like first of all, it was, it was learning like the really... I guess like the Jamaican farewells and you know the, the classics, the really old stuff. So you began to get a sense of this could take you a little bit further in terms of both percussion and melodic development. Yeah, and I, point, you yeah. know, I really enjoyed that, but I didn't really, it didn't really hit me yet. And and then around three years later, or 2000, 2001, I um, well, first the first thing that really got me interested more was um, learning panorama tunes. So okay. I'm in Canada, Maya. So you um, went to Trinidad at that time? Not yet. Not this yet? this okay. is just still at South okay. Carolina and you know, playing with the band. We would we would learn the, the charts, uh, like yeah, Panini Minor, um, uh, not not this feeling nice. Just the really known stuff that really gave you an extra feel for what the pan could do. Yeah. Right. Uh, misbehave. That I remember that changed my life. <laughs> those yeah, those those two and then and then, and then I went to North Texas for a year from mm -hmm. student exchange, and I got really into jazz. And, and I, I started doing a lot of transcriptions with drum set. But then, I, then my roommates were really in, in the in the like classic jazz, and and they were like, "Oh, you should do some steel pan, like some transcriptions." And he's like, well, "Why don't you take a Sonny Rollins solo mm -hmm. on St. Thomas and just transcribe that?" And I remember it was it was um it was. During Christmas break in 2000, I spent like 12 hours a day, like listening, slowing it down, transcribing yeah. it, and, and playing Sonny Rollins solo on uh, St. Thomas, and that, that really helped me start learning my way around the pan. 
and I just really enjoyed playing along with the recording just every day just so playing along. that was kind of like your baptism yeah that yeah. was that mm -hmm. was the time that was then, a crucible moment yeah and then I came back to South Carolina finished up my last semester there and and all my like my professors and everything like Jim Hall and Chris Lee they were they were like you gotta go to Trinidad Panorama is awesome and then, you know that's the next step so what you do you think do of that. Panorama what so, is yeah, Panorama well, to you after all these years as well I mean your first introduction yeah but um, what is your idea and what does it mean to you that then and now uh, <laughs> life I don't know it's like <laughs> The, the energy of, yeah. of um, just everybody playing so intense together. I, I mean, that, that was really life changing going down to Trinidad. I remember the first day I got there, this is 2002. I knocked on Ray Holman's door like 30 minutes after I got there. And he was like, hey, I want to play. <laughs> um, and, and he took me to the Starlift Pan Yard. And then so, did you hook up with Ray before? Me. No, I didn't know anybody. Um, just I just happened to be staying okay. a few blocks. I was in Woodbrook, okay. in Port of Spain. And I happened to be staying with Ellie and that sister. Okay. You know, I, I, um, I, I linked up with a travel agency that I forgot. They, they so they got me. things together yeah, and then you ended up I did, it was touching base with the rain. Yeah. Everything just kind of happened. Yeah, and I, asked, I literally asked somebody on the street. Mm -hmm. um, he ends up being a, a friend of mine to this day. And I was like, well, who should I talk? I'm going to play. Like, you know, who's he? he's like, let's go to Ray Holland's house. Okay. Two blocks away, knock on door and say, hey, I'm a pan player from the <laughs> States. I want, I want to play. Can I play maybe something? And he took me to the pan yard, and then, and then um, they, they started teaching me a song right then. Mm -hmm. That was Dr. Manette back in 2002. And then I, I started, that, that was awesome. Because then I, I just So that was your first everything. panorama then? Yeah, like real deal. With a, with a full band and everything, and uh, yeah, that's the, that's what opened me up. So, okay. and then I started really feeling music different. That from then on. You okay, know? you had a really close relationship with Skip Sergeant, Scipio Skip Sergeant. Um, he passed, but you guys really, you know, had something really strong. How did that relationship come about? I mean, he's one of the past uh, arrangers for Despas. USA Steel Orchestra and also a really great guitarist. But yeah, he's incredible. Um, How did that come about? Well, uh, so when I was down, all right. So I'll, I'll try to run through it quick. So when I was in Trinidad, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, um, I did I did Star Lift in, during Panorama season mm -hmm. in Carnival, and then I came back that same year and did a solo competition. Uh, the, World um, Steel Band Music Festival. Exactly. You came second. Yes, with Freddie Harris. Mm -hmm. We tied. And F Freddie Harris blew my mind. Like this, this guy was like incredible. And you that. guys are still close to this day because yeah, you've been arranging a panorama together here. Right, and I didn't yeah. even see him. So I, you know, I met him down there. It was really cool. I like looked up to him, and you know, all those cats. And and then I moved to I moved to New York the next year, 2003. It was the day of the blackout. That's when I moved here. Oh, and I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there <laughs> driving my car around Brooklyn. I'm like, what is up with this place? I was I was right <laughs> up the street in Brooklyn. And I drove down, to, I somehow made it down to Crown Heights, and I st started seeing Trinidadian flags everywhere. I was like, because, okay. you know, the, the blackout was right sort of before mm -hmm. Labor Day. And, um, and I started seeing flags everywhere, and then I started seeing, like, Trinity to the Bone and all that. Yeah, because you like, played the pentatonic that year. Yeah, and, and I was like, where's the, where's the band? Where's the band? <laughs> where, 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 I'm going to play. And he took me to Pantonic, so I met, um, you know, I met Bradley and, and, uh, and um, yeah, Club Bradley that year. And, and I got to play, I was very fortunate to do that. And, th and that same night, or a few nights later, I'm, I'm at the yard playing and I run into Freddie Harris. And I was like, man, we are, you know, I hadn't seen him in a year and a half. We remember the show, it was, like, it was awesome. And then from that day on, we, we, were, we were really tight. And, and he, he, he showed me a lot. And he also introduced me to like Kareem mm -hmm. and, and then the Skip, you know. Um, that's, I, you know, I met, I don't think I met Freddie's dad at that time, but I met Skip, yeah, you know. Um, and, and we called him Sarge, you know? Yeah. I, 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 met, I met him and then, you know, and then I, I ended up moving to Crown Heights in 2004. And I lived a block away from, from Sarge. Sarge, so okay. Every morning I would go to his house and, and take like jazz lessons, improv lessons. And he'd have his guitar out and I'd have my pan. 
we were kind of ha both half asleep and I'd wake up and be so <laughs> hyped. And it, these were like two hour lessons. They weren't, they were just, you know. That's a new meaning to every live day almost. Yeah. and then eat and sleep music. You it, literally did that. Yeah, I learned a lot. I didn't yeah. know what I was doing, but, but I, I learned a lot from, from Skip and also from, from Freddie. We, you know, he was living in, in um, Hell's Kitchen. Uh, with his mom I at the time. I think he still is. Yeah, he's still yeah. there. Um, same building, different mm -hmm. apartment, but we would go on the roof mm -hmm. there. And could, I'm, I'm blown away because you know, I'm, I'm in New York from South Carolina, and all of a sudden I'm on the top of the roof. <laughs> in Hell's right, Kitchen playing Yeah, pan. like <laughs> Times Square all around, and we're just yeah. playing pan until 4 in the morning every night. Ow! And uh, he's you know teaching me licks and mm -hmm. stuff. and it, It's so much information that I didn't even get it to like a year later immersed. I was just totally yeah. yeah and then I would come out to Eastern Parkway or, or East New York mm -hmm. with um, Iba Ture and 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 uh, Kareem and yeah. everybody and then Kofi and 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 Freddie and, and then Skip would be there and I would just learn from hearing all them and doing all that and then we started teaching and uh, around all this all this, you know, we started doing Sesame Flies. Flies, and, yeah, you arranged that here. And then, you know, so so Sarge really helped a lot. Um, I don't even know. I don't ever do any of that kind of stuff anymore. But it's all, it's it's still all, it's still it's part still of you. With me. It's it's yeah, who it's, makes it's you who you are today. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, so as a composer, you know, your musical creations have uh, weaved through both conventional and what some would term non-conventional approaches. Um, and of course, you focus on chamber and orchestral compositions as well. You know, describe you know your immense and varied body of work today. Just give us some insight into that. I know it's a tall order, but you know, highlights are fine. About like, like the type of pieces I'm writing these days. Yeah, you know, the evolution because you have had a varied journey. I mean, just listening to what you gave us an idea of tells us you know this is a interesting path. Some people just focused on one, but. Everything you're doing is is composed of all the places you've been musically, the people you've met, your experiences. So your body of work to date, um, talk about how that has developed and how you think your influences have really impacted on it. Yeah, it's it all started with Pan because you know I was like really trying to be a jazz musician and a lot of improv with still Pan. So I, w I would work on licks and solos and then. These solos became my first pieces. Like um, I call them the color pieces, synesthesia suite. Synesthesia suite. We want to so talk about that later. All, all yeah. those, you know, I started playing pan, and, and I never wrote them down until years later. Those pieces became my first compositions, and then they were only still pan solos, and then eventually orchestrated. So, those, starting to orchestrate them open me up to, to try to do compositions out, outside of just for still pan. So it all it all started as pan. Like a lot of composers, they, they'll compose at the piano and then orchestrate and stuff. Yeah. For me, it started with, with still pan. I, I see the patterns and understand the theory more. And, I mean, I can. It's it's more at home for me. Okay. I never grew up playing piano. Right. Even though I write for it. All the so time. you write on pen, and everything is an extension of that, essentially. When I started writing, but now writing it's different now. every time. Okay. Some, but now I've gone back to the pen, so it's like <laughs> the yeah. path is it's just it's a meandering one, right? Yeah, but I, that's what I love about about my life is that it, there's no consistency mm -hmm. in a good way, but. But, uh, but still pan is it's definitely what brought me into composition and then and then I went to Manhattan school in 2007 you did your um, master yeah I was doing I was still a percussion it was contemporary percussion but I was focusing on pan and that was like the first I, I, I think it was yeah I mean I don't, I don't think there was pan there before that really that I know <laughs> I mean I don't know Maybe, but yeah. for me to like specialize in a lot of the composers even the faculty composers there and and student composers were starting to write a lot for still pan because I was there, and but including it. And this know, is in the Manhattan School of Music, yeah. where you also did your synesthesia uh, suite. Yeah, when you guys, yeah, exactly. My, Talk my about how side. that body of work came together because it was influenced in part by experiences in the pan yards in Trinidad. Talk yes, about definitely. The steel pan works, known as the synesthesia suite. So synesthesia, I mean, from what I know, is like the. Com combining of two senses mm -hmm. so like you could smell something and, and see a color or something for me it works kinesthetic 
So like every time I play a certain note, I see a color. Or if I think about a certain note, even though I don't have perfect pitch, it's not like a, a perfect pitch, pitch thing that a lot of people have. So I remember, you know, when I was in Trinidad in 2002, we were playing Dr. Manette, playing this, um, I remember it was like an octatonic lick for about two hours straight. We just kept running this lick. And it started on a D. And every time I hit that D, I'd see orange. And that's what started it for me. So yeah, I, remember, I remember the day, like, I was like, man, this is like so vibrant. And then eventually the other pitches started coming. So it wasn't like I was... I was different colors. So hence yeah. we ended up with like reds and blacks. Yeah, and A colors. was the next one that yes. really came strong. A, red, aqua. Mm -hmm. But I remember, I remember that D was the first one. Just so, and still when I write today, it's like I want to bring in orange. And I'm, like, mm -hmm. I'm trying to orchestrate pieces based on colors. And that's how I think of the compositions. So you have been commissioned to write... Oh, should I say you've been commissioned to compose music works for the likes of Carnegie Hall. You've worked with the LA and uh, New York Philharmonics. Um, you have performed select places around the world. Talk about how some of these initiatives came together, your experiences there, and maybe what role Pan played and you know when it was a main component. Let's hear about that a bit. Okay, yeah, we're, we're with Pan, I mean, I just... I, just two days ago, I got back from Hong Kong, and that was my first experience there. There was a festival and, there. Yeah, I don't think anybody ever saw. I mean, mm -hmm. anybody that I saw never saw Penn there. And we played 21 for about four concerts there. And I was in Taiwan was, uh, two years ago. We did a 10 day tour down there with the Foundry and uh, you know, um, those co the color pieces we did a tour on. LA Phil was all Penn because uh, they, they invited us out. The, the foundry steel pan ensemble, mm -hmm. so the larger all steel pans, mm -hmm. um, and we did alloy out, out there for the Green Umbrella series. That was okay. that was in May 2012, and then um, New York Philharmonic was not steel pan, but uh, very percussion heavy uh, piece, uh, three percussion, piano, and strings. Okay, um, you're already the recipient of some key awards, and the last one that we know, having been. Um, put together April 8th, uh, it was the American Academy in Rome, the winners of the 118th Annual Rome Prize competition. In your case, it was for musical composition, the Luciano Berio Rome Prize. So talk about that and, you know, some of your awards over the years. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited about the Academy, American Academy in Rome because uh, in September 8th this year, I'll, I'll get them live there for a year, about said. a year, 11 months. Okay. And um, I'm, I, I'm just going to write like crazy. <laughs> yeah. but, but it's also really exciting because, you know, there's two composers there. It's uh, Paula Matheson and, and myself. And, and, and uh, we're, we're there for musical composition, but there's about 30 fellows there total. Yeah. So we'll be there and we'll be inspired by each know, other visual artists yeah. um, historians uh, architects it's a totally immersive experience yeah it's great right um, so I'm, I'm really excited about that okay um what would you like to accomplish in the near future i know that's a in the near future in the near future i want to finish and i want to make deadlines because <laughs> the, the pieces i have i'm really right. excited about i okay. just want to make sure i finish them in time um yeah there's a lot of a lot of pieces that I'm, I'm yeah, they're, they're really unique okay. works that I'll, that I'll be working on this next year. Okay, so just to put it into perspective, um, you did your bachelor's in music and that was at University of South Carolina, yes. and then Manhattan School of Music and Yale, both masters, yes. one was in a, what, contemporary music? And contemporary then performance at Manhattan School. And then the other one was music composition. Yale was music composition. And now you're presently at Princeton, yes. completing your doctoral. Yes. Okay. When do That's you? in composition. Too. Okay. And how is that going in terms of? Is there a finite date? Um, well, I'm done with classes. Okay. And I'm finished my morals, so I need to write a dissertation um, and a portfolio of compositions or a composition that's related to my dissertation. Okay. Um, what is Panorama to you? It's been a while, but what is it to you, essentially? 
um, currently? Like, well, in terms musically? of... Musically? Okay. Let me see. What is Panorama to you in the sense of you've been there, you experienced it at the beginning of your journey, you've experienced a lot of other influences since then, and now, you know, there is also... Um, the possibility that you will become involved with that at some point again in the future is scheduled for many. So what is your overall takeaway from Panorama? What I like about it is it, it, it just brings uh, so many personalities and, and um, I, don't, uh, I just, I really love the energy and the fire that it brings to... to the size of the orchestra is a surprise, yeah, the and, complete immersion. Yeah, and just the... Just the camaraderie, you know, like playing with so many people that, are, that really love music, and there's nobody has to be there. Like it's just, it's a really communal you know, experience. Yeah, yeah. And, but and then at such a high level, and it's just, I don't know, it's it a lot of fun to play, it's a lot of fun to arrange for. Um, yeah, I, I, I've been away from it for a while, but I, I miss those days. It was, okay. it was a lot, like a lot of my roots are from there. You compose around a lot of various subject matter, and one of the pieces you've written, Pan, is Crown Heights. Um, how did that come about, and how do you approach it? What does it mean to you to have it performed? Yeah, Crown Heights is, um, it was written for PS 167 mm -hmm. on Eastern Parkway. Okay. Uh, that was the first school I started teaching at through Arts Connection, and uh, that, that was great because you know, we started with six steel pans. They were doing like an assembly line. Mm. Like playing verse, then chorus, you know, six players. And then eventually, because that first year, uh, they got funding to send me to Trinidad and, and ship up 80 pans. Um, we started, 40, 40 pans got sent in 167, and 40 pans got sent to a school in the Bronx. And we started two new schools. Uh, to teach elementary school in, 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 uh, in Brooklyn and high school in the Bronx. And so working with the elementary school, they, they had, they started an after school program. And this was, yeah, this was like 2005, 2006. And in, and in 06, and, and a few years later, I got asked to write some pieces specifically for the, the kids. And the, I mean, the first thing that came to mind was Crown Heights. Because I mean, that's, that's where you were. Yeah. The, yeah. And that's where they, I feel like it was like almost like their national, I mean, their, their, their anthem for the school, like, you know, like, uh, so they, they were really excited to learn it. Okay. Um, what would you say to someone who wants to get involved in PAN, but like you started out with a, a varied sense of percussion? But they're saying to themselves, well, maybe Pan, but I'm, you know, where can I go with it? I mean, you're a perfect example of how far it can go. Yeah, I think it's just like with everything, you know, just take as many risks as possible. And and, and that means going going places you, you might not think of going, like physically and mentally, mentally with the yeah. music and, and physically, like going to Trinidad, going, being immersed in Crown Heights and, and, and just bringing Pan to anything. Uh, I mean, I used to go sit in at all the jazz clubs, you know? Right, and so. just And I would embarrass myself. You know, like, I I took a lot of risks and I, I failed so many times. And that that's where that's where the real learning happens, every time you fail. Um, well, not necessarily fail, no, you know, it's, it's like... It's just a yeah. step in your evolution, your musical right. evolution, okay. Tell us briefly a bit about your various um, ensembles you're involved with. Ensembles, like yeah, you have um, like the Foundry. Um, talk a bit about you know those groups that you have put together and or you are. Yeah, usually, part. usually w whatever I'm a part of is is the the good and bad thing about it is is it's always changing. Mm -hmm. So the bad thing about that would be I don't get to establish like a a specific sound that always happens. But that's also the good thing because every Every people come to see you, they hear something different. There's an aspect of Andy every time. Yeah. They experience who you are. Yeah, because even with like the foundry, like the smaller group, it's always changing. Like every time we play those pieces, and I, I can't wait till I have the time to write more for mm -hmm. smaller groups. Um, it's a different instrumentation. I don't think I've ever done the same piece, the same 
the same way Twice, and, you've, and yeah. you've never performed it the same way right even though it's kind of a set piece it's not like yeah it's not the same instrumentation or timbres or or even arrangements of it and then with the bigger this the foundry still then i mean that's that was only put together for that one piece mm -hmm. i haven't had any opportunities to write for that again but that was alloy and that's not even like a pen piece really it's more percussion on some piece um and then the other stuff is you know mixing steel pen and with um western classical instruments like i just finished a piece that got premiered two weeks ago for steel pen and violin it's more like a chamber well, um, anything else you want to talk about relative to Pan, or I think we've covered a whole lot. Yeah, I mean, okay. I, yeah, I, I don't well, know. Well, I just want to say thank you for sitting down with Wen Steel Talks and you know, you sharing with us, you know, exactly, well, I wouldn't say exactly, but giving us some insight into how, you know, your journey has come together, where you're at, and um, essentially that you're still a work in progress, and that's a beautiful thing musically and for your audience. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so yeah, thank you for sitting with Wednesday Talks and uh, all the best. You've got a lot of work ahead of you and you've got a lot of achievements still to come because we didn't even get to touch on some of the multitudes of awards that you've already received, but suffice to say there's a whole lot more to come your way, we're sure. Congratulations thank and thank you. Thank you very much. Wednesday Talks. Everybody listens.